Thanksgiving weekend, 2013. Two days post-Turkey. I can't say for sure what you were doing that afternoon. Unless you're from the state of Alabama. If so, I'd be willing to wager that your Saturday, at least in some way or another, revolved around a football game. A football game between the University of Alabama and Auburn University. An interstate rivalry that divides and never truly dies. Michelle Shepard was just one of those many football fans from Alabama with ties to one side, watching nervously and intently with a group of people. Her loyalty happened to be the Crimson Tide, and it happened to be a night favoring the Auburn Tigers. Shortly after Alabama lost the game by just six points on a last-second miracle touchdown, the watch party had bullets start flying. When the commotion cleared, Michelle was dead. The shooter, a woman Michelle didn't even know personally, wasn't an Auburn fan, but a fellow Alabama supporter. She killed Michelle because she didn't find her to be upset enough about Bama's loss. Michelle Shepard is a victim, and may she rest in peace. She's not the only one. The term victim is broad, but I'm not misleading you. Others have died and killed over this game of football. Most are victims in a different sense. This isn't a life or death situation. It's far more important. This is the Iron Bowl. Tighter Insider is an online message board for Alabama fans to talk about everything Alabama football. Generally, I use more official, credible sources for videos, but this isn't a case of finding stats or verifying facts. It's about the people in the rivalry. It's the way random humans inherently feel about each other based on what college football team they support. On the message board, when the question was posed, what event, if any, made you hate Auburn? One answer quickly rose to the top. My birth. I never knew there was a choice. Auburn has message boards too. It's an almost daily occurrence to see someone let out a long-winded rant simply titled, Why I Hate Alabama. It was a pretty good one. In a small West Alabama town, I stopped at a country store to get a drink. I've got on a navy polo shirt with an innocuous AU logo on the left. Nothing obnoxious or overbearing. Grizzled old coot in overalls behind the counter peers at me through his Joe Paterno glasses. Smells of stale aftershave and a lifetime of snuff. You've got some dog shit on your shirt, son, he rasps. And then cackles like he's just busted the funniest joke. I left the drink on the counter, put my money back in my pocket, and left. Didn't say a word. This is day-to-day -day life in the small towns in the hundred-mile radius of Tuscaloosa. This just starts to paint the picture. There's a running joke around the Auburn campus that Auburn fans get their t-shirts at Auburn. Alabama fans get theirs at Walmart. Meanwhile, in Tuscaloosa, where the tide rolls in, if you need a quick laugh, someone might hit you with this. An Auburn man at a cocktail party sees a well-dressed gentleman wearing a graduation ring with a blue stone. The Auburn man says, Where'd you go to school? The gentleman responds, Yale. The Auburn man loudly reiterates, Where'd you go to school? Both jokes are funny. Both jokes poke fun at the education level of the other school's fans. It makes sense that they would attack similar things in each other, because they have the same weaknesses. Because these are the same people. The state of Alabama is in the bottom five in the country in education. Both jokes are sound in logic. With this, Alabama is heavily stereotyped by many others. Rednecks, hillbillies, keep it in the family, I'm sure you've heard them. From an outsider's perspective, a lot of people like to say, the Iron Bowl is the battle of the trailer park, dumb versus dumber fighting for who's which. But from inside the cotton state lines, where it means the most, they're all too busy at war with each other to care what anyone else thinks about them. The campuses in Auburn and Tuscaloosa are separated by about 150 miles. On each the eastern and western side of the state, Alabama's two biggest universities engage in a yearly battle that is the angriest, most intense, and bitter rivalry in all of college sports. And I expect some pushback for saying this, 
but it just may be the best rivalry too. While I'm sure plenty of folks from the fine places of Ohio, Michigan, and the armed forces disagree with me, to you guys, I say, I don't care, I don't care, and thank you very much for your service, sir, you hold whatever opinion you'd like. No two teams have a rivalry like Auburn and Alabama. No teams have the same embedded disdain for one another in their DNA. No one takes it quite as serious as the folks in Dixieland. Whether that's a good or bad thing is for you to decide. Now, the actual football itself is iconic, transcendent, we'll go over plenty of it, but lots of rivalries have great, intense, meaningful games. What pushes this conflict to being more akin to war than competition doesn't happen on the field. It's the fans. The ones actively despising each other. Families are split apart, friendships are lost forever, people are killed, trees are poisoned. The Iron Bowl is not a football game. It's 364 and a half days of gloating or sorrow, then a three hour pause to see which one you'll do next. It's these fans who willingly partake in all of this that propel the game to what it is and shave years off their lives constantly stressing about it. And they wouldn't have it any other way. I'm known as an outsider in this rivalry. I've never been to the South. I have no allegiance or ties to either side. This allows me to stay unbiased, but it also removes the fire and intensity that either side would carry. And again, that's what makes the rivalry. But just statistically, many of you are outsiders too. Bama and Auburn fans, you already know the deep-seated intensity of the rivalry. But I found an excellent piece of media that illustrates the game from the point of view of a stranger to it. Stephen Fry, a British actor, had a TV show where he toured all 50 states in America, attempting to show an ounce of American culture across the pond. Where else do you think Fry found himself than the most American thing one could experience? I really don't know if anything sums up America better. It's simultaneously preposterous. <laughs> Incredibly laughable, impressive, charming, ridiculous. One comment on this video sums it up perfectly. An actual, real-life example of the European mind cannot comprehend this. And to make it even better, when the Jets flew over the stadium after the national anthem, I think Stephen Fry's head actually almost exploded, being that in Europe, a jet flyover for a sporting event is a foreign idea. Again, I stress, it's the fans that make this game. It extends so much further than football. And I can tell you why. There's three reasons that the Iron Bowl is different from every single football game in the country. First, Alabama and Auburn are in the same state and are the two biggest schools in that state. Two, there are no professional sports teams in the state of Alabama, which requires all athletics attention to be placed onto the collegiate level. There's literally nothing else to root for. You have to choose a side if you want major local sports. And three, both teams have, of course, been pretty damn successful over the last 80 years or so, establishing themselves as college football powerhouses. The Iron Bowl almost always has bowl game implications. It usually affects the SEC championship. It's not rare for it to hold weight on the national champion. These three attributes can each individually be applied to countless matchups in the country, but I'm not sure there's a single other one that can claim all three. You stir these together in a pot, add unmatched levels of animosity, and get a southern soul food dish of football. And to be honest, you can't even blame the current fans. Auburn and Alabama were destined to hate each other long before any of us were alive. The Civil War ended in May of 1865. Though no formal peace treaty was signed to signify this, General Robert E. Lee's surrendering is marked as the end. Just about two months before that, when the writing was already on the wall for the South, Union forces burned down a majority of the University of Alabama campus, leaving just a few buildings standing. 
Though founded over 30 years ago in an established university, before the start of the war, the school transitioned to a military emphasis, turning into a teaching and training grounds for future Confederate soldiers. It was, of course, an all-male school at the time, so much of the faculty and students had already enlisted in the war anyway. It would be six years before U of A reopened its academic doors, and it was that six-year period that would serve as the catalyst for alumni, students, fans, and citizens to utterly detest the other major college in the state. Auburn University did not exist yet as we know it. It was chartered by Methodists just prior to the Civil War as the East Alabama Male College, but quickly was closed down in 1861 and the campus used by Confederate soldiers. With no catastrophic event on the grounds though, they were able to quickly reopen after the war ended, five years before the major school on the west end of the state. Still, that didn't instantly propel them above Bama. By 1871, when both schools had come back, the East Alabama Male College recorded an enrollment of less than 100 students, while Alabama unimpressively topped that with 107. But something was about to shake up the state. It had already been rumbling for a decade. By the way, this is a quick chart of Auburn's name history. They didn't officially become Auburn until 1960, but for simplicity, I'm just going to be referring to them as that. In 1862, President Lincoln signed a bill into law known as the Land-Grant Act. This bill provides that for each U.S. Senator and Representative a state has, that state would receive 30,000 acres of public land for the purpose of building a university on. As the law was passed in midst of the war, Confederate states were automatically excluded from it, but just a couple years later, that clause was removed and the land was there for the taking. Under this, the state of Alabama was now entitled to 240,000 acres of land from the government. Then the real question came, who gets the land? In a long-standing legislative battle that would foreshadow how conflict was to be handled in this rivalry, we wouldn't get that answer for years. Auburn was struggling financially and needed the land. They needed to become a government-run school. It was kind of their only hope of continuing. Their plea was read as desperate. The school had announced a lack of funding was about to make them cease operations entirely. So get the land grant or no more college in Auburn. Simple. The Methodists in charge were willing to completely hand over full control of the school and surrendered the 100 acres of land they already had. But the University of Alabama had the strongest case. Their idea was to turn the land grant into a branch of U of A in Tuscaloosa. This would not only make the school a mega university and the premier college in the state, but would also put that annoying little school out east to bed for good. Alabama had it in the back. The state government and education board, the ones making the decision, were both scattered with alumni from the university. If they didn't go there themselves, chances are some of their powerful buddies did have crimson ties, and it's likely that almost every board member was schmoozed in some corruptive way. The kindling, even years before the first football game played, was sparked by Auburn literally fighting to stay alive as a school and Alabama trying their best to put them down. When the time for a decision finally arrived in 1872, and the city of Auburn somehow won the land grant to be gifted all that land, it was the first of many upsets they would pull off against that old Goliath of Tuscaloosa. It was the first time they made Bama fans stew in their own rage with nothing they could do about it. And that was a feeling worth holding on to. Alabama staying closed for so long, while no fault of their own, hurt their chances bad. Over the next 152 years, both colleges would grow up. But things between the two, their relationship in 2024 versus their relationship in 1872, not a ton changed. I never will go back to Alabama that is not the place for me. The first football game took place in 1893. Auburn won by 10 points. Auburn recorded the game as the first matchup of its 1893 season, while Alabama considered it the last matchup of the 92 season, as it took place in the month of February. 
To this day, the schools have not resolved this difference in opinion, and the first game continues to be recorded differently by both sides. There could not have been a more accurate way to kick things off. They'd play a total of 12 games against each other up to the year 1907. Auburn had the edge in the early days. It should be noted that each of these games would barely look like football to us today. The forward pass was introduced in 1906 for some time reference, but they all count the same. They're still counted today. Auburn led the series 7-4 with a tie. What happened next is weird. For the following 41 years, Alabama and Auburn could not agree on a single thing, and virtually hated each other so much that the teams outright refused to play a football game together. The Iron Bowl went dormant. Now, it's not unheard of in collegiate rivalries to take a break. Baylor and Texas A&M is one of the more storied matchups in sports, but because of some conference realignment issues, they haven't played each other since 2011. Rivalries can fizzle out and back in. The Iron Bowl did not fizzle out. Or back in. For two teams so close together in proximity, playing in the same state, in the same conference the whole time, to just stop competing for over 40 years out of pure resentment to do so, is unique. You may think having a break, especially such a long dead spot, would weaken a rivalry, even if it does end up coming back. And that's valid. Ohio State and Michigan played continuously for over a hundred years before COVID reset their streak, and Army and Navy are still going continuously since 1945. That's a fair point, I won't pretend otherwise. But in my opinion, the reasons behind the break, the hundredth layer of distinctiveness in this game, fits perfectly into the puzzle of Iron Bowl lore, and makes it that much more special. The tie game in 1907 was a benchmark for various reasons. It's the only tie in series history, it's the last game before the break, and it's the day Alabama actually got the nickname of the Crimson Tide after managing to fend off heavily favored Auburn. In a good old-fashioned mud bowl, Alabama's official website says, quote, Birmingham's iron-rich soil turned to a sea of red mud, which stained Alabama's white jerseys. Based on that, one reporter gave him a nickname that just might stick around for a while. This day would eventually grow to become the subject of much controversy. The question is, why did Auburn and Alabama stop playing football? And there's three answers to it, with varying levels of truth. First, for many years, and still loosely today, it was claimed that the Iron Bowl was cancelled due to absurd fan and player violence in this 1907 game. Angry, wet fans, and neither side got to bask in victory, it would make sense. But while the mentioned violence likely did take place, that wouldn't have been anything out of the ordinary, especially for this game. Fan brawls weren't even reported in the paper, they were seen as normal. The second reason involves a more on-the-field anger. Alabama, for the last two years, had been toying with a system of shifts on offense, not just a one-man motion. Every single player besides the center would move around pre-snap, which is awesome to try and picture. I wish we had video. But it was a tactic that Auburn and their head coach Mike Donahue did not find very cash money, despite being fully legal in football rules at the time. Donahue threatened that unless Alabama stopped this and agreed to let a referee from the North officiate the game, Auburn would cancel it. They felt any official from the South would have an inherent bias towards Bama. The third reason, and the one with the most backing, is that the schools just couldn't agree on anything. In planning the 1908 game, Auburn suggested a $3.50 a day per diem for every player, and the ability to take up to 22 guys. Alabama countered with $3 a day for 20 athletes. The sides couldn't agree. When the 1908 season rolled around, they each filled out their schedule, and it was too late to add the game by the time a compromise was reached. Thus, the Iron Bowl was cancelled over $34. That stopped it for one year, and both sides refusing to budge kept it from coming back for a long while. I like to think of the break in the conflict not as a long patch with no football, but as a time where Bama and Auburn were just competing in a different game. The next 41 years, either side probably could have gone on over, apologized, and asked to get the rivalry going again. It would have happened. 
But take your guess which one of these two schools was going to tuck their tail between their legs and do it. We didn't have a lack of football. We had a surplus of pettiness. And that battle would see a world war, a global pandemic, eight U.S. presidents, the Great Depression, and another world war before it ended. A couple political events should also be noted. In 1907, a debate surfaced in the state legislature to move the land-grant college out of Auburn. Though it never made it far, it was a reminder that powerful Alabama alumni were continuously attempting to bring Auburn to its knees, not by beating them in football, but by destroying the university entirely. Over the years of no Iron Bowl, a number of attempts would be made at the state government level to cut funding to the college in Auburn. Take a guess who was behind those attempts. If Alabama had it their way, Auburn would not exist right now. How could they not hate each other? 1964 was a disappointing year for Auburn football. They sat at 6-3 without a quality win in sight. Even before the Iron Bowl, Auburn was ousted from bowl game consideration. One game remaining on the schedule with nothing left to play for. At least, that's what it looked like to you and me. Auburn's head coach was a man named Ralph Jordan, nicknamed Suge for his love of sugarcane, which there might not be a more southern way to get a nickname. Suge was a staple at Auburn. He'd been their head honcho since 1951, a 25-year career in total when he would retire in 75. Right now, though, even with a seemingly hopeless season, his mind was on one thing. When asked by reporters how he was handling the rough season and the reality of not getting to take his squad to a bowl game, Chug responded candidly, We've got our bowl game. We have it every year. It's the Iron Bowl in Birmingham. With these words, Ralph Jordan is credited with coining the Iron Bowl phrase, and it was from that point on that the game would become known as such. The name comes from Birmingham's plentiful history of steel manufacturing, sometimes being referred to as the Pittsburgh of the South. And coming into the 64 matchup, Alabama had a team, led by quarterback Joe Namath and an alright coach of their own. The Tide were undefeated on the season, bolstered by three top 10 victories. A win against Auburn would virtually guarantee them to be named national champs for the season. Their coach was Paul Bryant, a man far better known by his nickname Bear. Bear Bryant was in the middle of his own 25-year coaching tenure at Alabama. Bryant got his lifelong nickname when, as a 13-year-old boy, he wrestled a live bear at a local carnival for a reward of one dollar. The bear bit off a piece of Bryant's ear. He was never paid the dollar by the carnival. I would like to formally retract my previous statement. There's a more southern way to get a nickname. This matchup held yet another hallmark in Iron Bowl history, as the first game to be nationally televised between the two. The rest of the world was about to be properly introduced to the battle for Alabama bragging rights. An old Press Register article painted a vivid picture of the atmosphere just minutes before kickoff. Now quoting, Thousands roamed the stadium outside, hoping somehow to get into the game and apparently ignoring the fact that it was on national television. The tension became almost unbearable by the time the final strains of the Star-Spangled Banner had floated across the stadium, and it was as if the world stood still for this football game. For the first time, a national TV audience observed the Alabama Backyard Brawl, and it had all the ingredients to keep fans interested. With Shug and Bear on the sidelines and pride at stake, it was war. Despite being the overwhelming favorite, Alabama entered the second half with a stagnant offense and a one-point deficit, down 7-6. To open the second half, Alabama housed the kickoff return 107 yards for a touchdown to take control. Though Auburn fought, the game came down to an onside kick that they needed and didn't get. Alabama wins. They would go on to lose to Texas in the Orange Bowl, but because many selectors at the time did not release a post-bowl ranking, Alabama is recognized as a 1964 national champion. Winston Groom was a student at Alabama during the 64 Iron Bowl. He didn't play football. It's unclear if he was even at this game. It's been heavily speculated, though, but never confirmed, that he would go on to draw inspiration from Alabama's 107-yard touchdown return in this game for a character in a novel he was writing. That novel being Forrest Gump. 
The Bama win evened the rivalry up all time at 14 wins apiece. The Tide did have a slight lead since we came back. By the way, how'd we get back? You're familiar enough with these two teams to guess they didn't just drop their anger and move on. What did it take to make the Alabama colleges play each other again? Well, the government had to force them to. Kinda. A resolution was passed that strongly encouraged the universities to continue their athletic relationship, with threats to withhold amounts of funding from both schools. Thus, the rivalry was brought back into existence via legislation, because even if the teams themselves didn't want to do it, the fans of each side couldn't live without it. It was agreed that the game would be played at a neutral site every year, in Birmingham, at Legion Field. Before the first game back, Auburn and Alabama's SGA presidents came together to hold a ceremony encouraging fans to put issues in the past. A lot of people were worried about tensions sparking back up with the reignition of the rivalry. Brawls were expected, so to say. So to bury the hatchet, they literally buried a real hatchet. Like actually put one in the earth. Powerful symbolism. A fierce police warning was issued to fans of both sides. Then a football game was played. It's a factual certainty that within hours, maybe even just minutes of that hatchet being put in the ground, some fan from one side or the other, pulled it back out. And that's the real beautiful metaphor for the chances of peace between these two schools. Alabama won 55-0, the largest margin of victory in Iron Bowl history. At one point in the middle of the break, when it was well accepted as the status quo, Auburn's president said the game should never return because, quote, football would tend to become all the topic of both institutions. A while later, Alabama's board of trustees agreed with him, fearing the game would lead to quote, accelerated overemphasis of football in the state. <laughs> like that would ever happen. In 1974, we had a great matchup. Number 7 Auburn had just one loss on the year, and number 2 Alabama was undefeated. In the second quarter, the Tide kicked a field goal to make their lead 10 to nothing. Just as that happened, two men who were watching the game together in Tennessee got into an argument over whether he really made it or not. Just as that happened, two men who were watching the game together in Tennessee got into an argument over the field goal. Then one of the men shot the other in the head twice with a pistol. He died. His name was Paul Harris. It was the second quarter of the football game. This game would also slightly change the rules of college football forever. A little later, Auburn completed a deep touchdown pass on third down and began celebration. It was still a ball game. Then Bear Bryant started getting angry and the refs started conversating. Then a flag was thrown. In what has become known as the Gossam incident, Auburn wide receiver Tom Gossam was ruled to have run out of bounds before catching the ball, constituting a penalty of illegal touching. There wasn't a clear angle of instant replay that proved whether he stepped out or not. Auburn fans argued that even if he did, he had been forced out by the defender. But unfortunately, that part didn't matter. In the college rulebook at the time, all it said was that a receiver could not come back inbounds and catch the ball. Alabama won the game. Four years later, the rule was tweaked to add that if a player was forced out, he could reestablish himself and come back inbounds to make a catch. A 40-0 shutout gave Auburn its first consensus national championship in 1957, despite them being on NCAA probation. It's said that Auburn beat him so bad this year, Alabama had to go out and hire a bear to get back at him. And this was a bad Alabama team, with just two wins on the year, but it wasn't even as bad as two years ago when they had their worst season in program history at 0-10. The 1967 rendition is remembered fondly by one side. In another mud puddle rumble that happened to be the first night game in Iron Bowl history, the teams played a half ugly scoreless football, and by late in the fourth quarter, Auburn was clinging to a 3 0 lead. Then Ken Stabler took off dashing and slipping his way to a historic 47 yard touchdown run. The run in the mud was then forever ingrained into the lore. Tiger fans didn't have to be too sad, their iconic moment wasn't long away. First, they got one that just felt good. 
The 1969 game was over. Auburn had a 22-point lead with just about 60 seconds to play. They were about to put a punt into the sky that only the gamblers and stat sheets cared about. Celebration had already ensued for half the state. Then Auburn faked the punt. A long, demoralizing 85-yard touchdown on fourth down, up 22. There is no clearer way to convey disgust and disdain for your opponent. 1971 saw the first ever Iron Bowl where both teams were undefeated and untied coming into play. Number 3 Alabama handedly beat number 5 Auburn. Then, we got an epic piece of Iron Bowl pie. In 1972, a top 10 matchup presented itself yet again. Undefeated, second in the country Alabama, and the 9 seed Auburn, stained by a single loss. It wasn't living up to the hype much. Alabama in total control, up 16 in the fourth quarter. When Auburn elected to kick a field goal with less than 10 minutes left in the game, instead of trying to push for a touchdown, the crowd booed. Auburn fans booed. Alabama got the ball back, up two possessions, and Auburn was able to force a punt. They happened to block it and housed it for a touchdown. Okay, one possession game. The very next drive, Bama had to punt again. And Auburn blocked it. Again. The same guy got a hand on it, and the same guy ran it into the end zone. If you were paying half attention, you would have assumed you were watching an instant replay. But no one in Alabama was paying half attention. For years to come, on every fourth down Alabama faced, still today, Auburn fans would emphatically chant, Punt Bama Punt, just what the game would be eternally known by. David Langer, the man who scooped and scored both the special team's touchdowns, would then cap his storybook night with an interception to truly seal the deal. Auburn wins. An old rumor says that when he got to the sideline after the pick, his head coach Shug Jordan looked unimpressed and unhappy. Coach, I intercepted the pass, Langley pleaded. Yeah, but our plan was to make him punt, Coach responded. A couple years later was 1977. For a second now, let's move to the sport of basketball. The rivalry exists on the hardwood, but it's nowhere near the same levels of animosity. Neither school has a storied hoops history. The matchup does play a small hand in the football Iron Bowl, as the actual trophy is presented at halftime of the basketball game between the two. The ODK president of the losing school also has the duty of performing the winning school's fight song at that halftime, a fun little tradition. But in 1977, Alabama and Auburn were not playing each other on the basketball court. They had some special preseason matchups set up. Auburn, an exhibition with the Czechoslovakian national team, while Alabama got scheduled against the USSR team on the same court right after. A basketball game against the Russians at this time was quite something. This was well into the Cold War, a time period where children are growing up practicing nuclear bomb drills in school. Tension would be an understatement. This was also three years away from a much more important sporting event between the USA and USSR. But before we were overcoming the odds in one of the greatest athletic feats of all time, some Americans, specifically Auburn fans who stayed behind after their game, were cheering for the Soviet Union to win. A number of people stayed and cheered against Alabama, including Auburn's play-by-play -play announcer, self-admittedly. The same man behind the iconic call from the punt Bama punt game spoke about finding himself subconsciously rooting for the Soviets. Some of these Auburn fans would, in the coming years, be shipped off to serve across the planet in the Cold War. These fans were cheering on a basketball team representing a country that they were actively at war with. But hey, it's better than cheering for Bama. Oh yeah, and the communists beat Alabama that day. Is this a proper time to say it just means more? Let's revisit the message boards. I found a rare artifact here. This is an Alabama football fan on an Alabama forum with a long write-up giving props to an Auburn player. For real, he was nice, genuine, called him a great role model for every kid in the state. It's some heartfelt stuff. You don't see this energy too often in the Iron Bowl. The top comment on this post? Yeah, the Nazis had some good soldiers too. Let's lighten the mood. 
what do a maggot and the University of Alabama have in common? They can both live off a dead bear for 20 years. Let's darken the mood again. Mixed marriages. This can refer to multiple things. Interracial, interfaith. People who come from two different worlds falling in love. It's a beautiful thing. Many places still have cultural stigmas that push to disallow certain types of this love. Every time an Auburn and Alabama fan fall in love, an angel cries. But it does happen. There's plenty of households with red and blue decor. A mixed marriage in this state has a uniquely Alabama meaning. One fan found his miracle, a woman from the opposite side of the spectrum that didn't enrage him. They fell in love. They had children. He posted about it, gleefully, reminding everyone that some things can be bigger than a football game. The Lord has truly blessed you, another fan replied. But I don't think he requires that you cheer for Auburn. The Lord, though all loving and all forgiving, does have limits to his patience with Satan's troopers. Alabama went on a streak through the 70s, the longest streak in Iron Bowl history. With nine wins in a row, Bama won three national championships from 73 to 79. It had to feel hopeless in Auburn. This doesn't look like a rivalry. Then Auburn found a running back named Bo Jackson. The guy has two Iron Bowls named after him, although one of them is... we'll get there. 1982. It's 22-17 Bama. Just over two minutes sit on the clock. Auburn has the ball. It's fourth and goal. Half a yard away from the end zone. What do you do? Bo knows. Bo goes, over the top of the goal line, sailing for the touchdown that would put Auburn on top for good. The streak was over. 1983 might be my personal favorite edition of the game. Bo Jackson ran for an Iron Bowl record at the time, 256 rushing yards. The whole game was played under threat of severe storms. In fact, most were predicting tornadoes, plural, possibly in the path of Legion Field. The fans still showed up. The game had pleasant skies for the first half. With about 50 seconds to play in the second quarter, though, all televisions in the area were interrupted with a tornado warning. It's important to realize well over 75% of active TV sets in Birmingham and neighboring counties would have been tuned into this game and weren't happy having it interrupted for some hoopla about the weather. Tornadoes had already been spotted near Tuscaloosa, some 60 miles away from the stadium. Reportedly around halftime, as skies started darkening to an ominous tone, the Goodyear blimp, which happened to be present, started flying one way and didn't stop. They got the hell out of there. A sort of bad omen. Anyone thinking clearly knew it was time to get away now and protect yourself. Almost every fan in the stadium stayed put. They had a game to watch. Towards the end of the third quarter, Bo Jackson took off on a 71-yard touchdown run that was put onto a split screen live while happening for another round of tornado warnings. This is Harry Brown from BRC6 Weather. Goodbye. In your face. The storm was now directly in line and expected to cross through Legion Field. With 10 minutes to go, a message was being read aloud on the stadium PA, warning everyone of imminent danger. Very few flinched. Auburn pulled out their second win in a row and finished the season third in the country, with one loss much earlier in the year. Luckily, the tornado did not touch down in Birmingham, basically out of sheer luck. It would hit a shopping center in Oxford, killing multiple people in its wrath. Some say had the Iron Bowl not been happening, way more people would have been out and about that day, running errands and shopping, and that the timing of the football game may have accidentally saved lives, while people were willingly endangering their own lives just being there. Weird. Regardless of how it ended, everyone in that stadium had the same choice. Stay and hope for the best, risk becoming a national tragedy, or miss the Iron Bowl. Over 95% of the stadium got wet and watched the game that day. Not much demonstrates the mentality of a football fan from Alabama better. Then Auburn had three in a row sitting in their fingertips. They were down 17-15 with the ball on the one yard line, fourth and goal. It's deja vu. We've seen this movie before. 
Bo Jackson just misheard the call this time. That's it. It was a simple mental mistake. It wasn't even a play for Bo. It was a pitch right to the fullback. Bo was the lead blocker, but he ran left. The game lives on in Iron Bowl lore as wrong way Bo. Announcer Al Michaels, just seconds after it happened, dropped this sentence. They'll be talking about that from now to the year 2020 in Birmingham. Well, here we are. In 1985, Bo Jackson's senior year, where he took home the Heisman, the four-season stretch of Iron Bowl Mania came to an end with one of the most famous versions of the game ever. Tides were truly starting to flip. Alabama was well into the post-Bear Bryant era and walked into this game unranked. Auburn was seventh in the country. They were gaining supremacy. But if you go walk around Tuscaloosa households today... There's a reason you'll see a weird amount of Van Tiffin paintings. Alabama's place kicker uniquely cemented himself in the state's history when he drilled a 52-yard field goal as time expired to hand Bama the upset win. Van Tiffin is like an Alabama celebrity to the level a college place kicker from the 1980s usually is not. But Auburn was still ready to take over. Their streak to close out the 80s is arguably the most impressive one in Iron Bowl history. It's not the longest, it's not even Auburn's longest, but all four of these wins in a row came against a top 20 ranked Alabama team. Two of them, Auburn was the lower ranked team. None were more special than 1989. Since the long break, remember, every single Iron Bowl had been played at Legion Field in Birmingham. The team switched off every year who was designated as home and away. Legion Field was a pretty good spot. For a long time, it was bigger than both Auburn and Alabama's home stadiums. Auburn played a good amount of home games there outside of the Iron Bowl when they had a marquee matchup. But Auburn was starting to feel like the neutral site wasn't so neutral. Because the Crimson Tide also played some home games at Legion Field. A lot more than Auburn did. Bama even played every home game of their 1987 season at Legion due to construction on their own stadium. The so-called middle ground was also about 50 miles away from campus in Tuscaloosa. It was about three times that for Tiger players and fans. Legion Field didn't feel very equal anymore. So the Iron Bowl came to the city of Auburn, and in its inaugural appearance, Auburn completely destroyed the national title hopes of undefeated second-ranked Bama. The Tigers head coach was a man named Pat Dye, who had served as an Alabama assistant under Bear Bryant earlier in his career, making him sort of a treasonous, I guess? He had seen both sides of the bloodshed. In the locker room post-game, Dye famously compared Auburn winning their first real home game to the toppling of the Berlin Wall two years earlier. If you are from any of 49 specific states like I am, that statement has to sound unbelievably wild. Alabama chose to continue waging the war of pettiness. If Auburn didn't want to play at a neutral site, then let them have their home games. We don't need one. Alabama kept playing Iron Bulls in Birmingham. Now get ready for a stretch. 91, Bama leads by 6 with less than 20 seconds left. Auburn has a desperation heave at the end that doesn't find fate. Ball game. 92, Alabama won, and went on to have a consensus national championship. Fearing imbalance in the system, Auburn won the 93 showdown, went undefeated, and was named national champion by one selector, though couldn't play in a bowl game due to probation. 94, both teams walk in undefeated. Number 4 versus number 6 in the polls. With 30 seconds left, Alabama forces a turnover on downs to preserve their 7-point lead and win. A little after Bama got the game-clinching stop on defense, two neighbors got into an argument. The men lived in Greenville, Alabama, pretty centered off in the state relative to east-west. It's a battleground city, middle territory, where allegiances to both sides are sure to mix. Richard Nichols, an Auburn fan, was murdered at the hands of a shotgun blast fired by a Bama fan. The killer happened to be married to Nichols' ex-wife, so the Iron Bull, which was listed as the cause that led to the murder might have just been the icing on the cake here. 95, 30 seconds left, Auburn's up by 4, Bama has the ball driving. They score a dagger of a touchdown, but oh, he was out of bounds. Auburn holds on for the win. 
96, 25 seconds left. Bama does score a go-ahead touchdown on a nifty catch and run to win the game by one point. 97, 42 seconds left. Bama, unranked, coming off three straight losses in the season, is favored to lose to number 13 Auburn. But right now, Bama has the ball and the lead. Time to run the clock out, seal the win, go home. You wish it was that simple. Bama fumbles a screen pass. Auburn kicks a game-winning field goal with 15 seconds to go, while the Alabama player who fumbled breaks down in tears on the sideline. Somehow, Alabama gets past midfield in 9 seconds and has a long field goal attempt of their own as time expires. It falls short. Auburn wins. That is seven Iron Bowls in a row of just awesome football. Nothing less and a whole lot more. Sports Talk Radio is a phenomenon that just seems more American than anything else in existence. It didn't come along till the 60s, decades after we were already putting sporting events on radio. But rather than broadcasting live or pre-recorded games, the Sports Talk Show is a format that focuses on commentary and discussions about any aspect of sport. The celebrity tabloid world of athletics. In Alabama, in the 90s, one sports talk show was introduced that would launch a man to stardom and become an auditory bible to the people of the state on both sides of the game. This is Paul Feinbaum, and this is an example of the Paul Feinbaum show. You know what? I'm going to tell you something. You got a disgusting show, you put on these propaganda lies like that little Matty Batty Fashion me, and he didn't know a damn thing about me. And you know what kind of sports career I had before I got injured. But I'm going to tell you something, Polly. You got one hell of a call on that JK cat. He, I don't like him. I don't like him. He lied about me, but he's an entertaining caller. Feinbaum recognized that people don't need to listen to a plain looking white guy talk his own opinion on sports. What they do need to listen to, in the state of Alabama at least, is literally anyone bad mouthing their college football team. Feinbaum made a career off of giving his two cents and then letting various callers from all shades of the rainbows give theirs. Callers known simply and affectionately by names like Tammy from Clanton, Phyllis from Molga, and Al from Dadeville. This is a style of radio show now popular literally everywhere. Feinbaum has been upgraded to his own TV show on ESPN where he basically does the same thing he's been doing for over 30 years. Because it doesn't matter if every city in every state has their own version of the Paul Feinbaum show, none of them have the viewing population of the Iron Bowl to feed unlimitedly hysterical content every day of the year. I couldn't make this video without including Paul. He's truly a central figure in the rivalry for decades now, and not putting him in the picture just wouldn't be painting it all the way. Auburn went on their longest streak ever, six in a row in the early 2000s. Not to take credit away, but it was helped made possible by Alabama being trounced by NCAA punishments for recruiting violations. That sent the tide through a historically awful stretch in which they were only ranked for two of the games. But the sixth straight loss also happened to be the first Iron Bowl coached by Nick Saban. Alabama dominated the next year, had the one seed, but lost in the SEC championship. Then they won a national title the year after that, their first since 1992. Parody. What's that? Oh, parody. Yeah, Auburn won the Iron Bowl and the national title the very next year. This was another iconic version of the game, as Auburn came back from a 24-point deficit led by Heisman Trophy winning quarterback Cam Newton, with this one aptly being dubbed the Camback. Huh. Screw parody, Alabama won the next two natties in a row. We're ping-ponging now. In a stretch that had not been seen since the 1940s, two teams solely accounted for four national championships in a row. And I know what you're gonna say. I know what the problem is. Auburn only got one. Alabama won three. It's not a rivalry. Alabama's just really good. Yeah. Okay. Alabama's just really good. What could Auburn ever do to make up for three Bama titles in four years? How could they ever make themselves feel good again? Auburn is the seventh ranked team in the country, with a single loss to LSU months ago. The Tigers are in a rivalry game, but not the one we're used to. The Deep South's oldest rivalry may not be the coolest or most accurate name, but 
the universities of Georgia and Auburn have been able to produce some showdowns, especially in the last 20 years. And I don't know if any of them are better than this one. Georgia came in ranked 25th, a disappointing spot in their season, but there was good news. Running back Todd Gurley was returning against Auburn from an injury. That didn't seem to matter. Auburn dominated the first half, coming into the tunnel up 27-10. It could have been more if their kicker Cody Parkey didn't have a field goal blocked in the second quarter. Take the lead. The Auburn Stadium deflated, without having earned a first down in the entire fourth quarter up to now. They got stuffed pretty quickly again. On a fourth and 18, with time and hopes dwindling, a Why do we watch this play in a video about Auburn and Alabama? I don't know, I guess just to show you whose side fate was on. This win took Auburn up to number four in the poll, heading into the Iron Bowl. Alabama was Alabama, undefeated one seed Goliath. With a tie game in the fourth quarter, Bama forced a punt that resulted in a beautiful display of punter magic being downed right at the one yard line. Then AJ McCarron threw a pass to Amari B, the most memorable play from this Iron Bowl. Bama up seven in the fourth, things are coming together. Auburn knew that, which is why they chose to go for it on 4th and 1 from their own 35. But they got stuffed. A practically guaranteed 2 possession lead for Alabama wasn't to be. Nick Saban chose to go for it himself on 4th and 1 from Auburn's 13. That sounds like a gimme field goal, but Saban had his reasons. Alabama had missed 2 kicks already today. They got stuffed on 4th as well. After an Auburn punt, Alabama tried again at a field goal, and it got blocked, Cade Foster's third miss of the day. Somehow still alive, Auburn had the ball down seven. They drove a little and with 32 seconds left, tossed a deep game-tying touchdown bomb. Alabama moved the ball a bit, but as the clock expired, TJ Yeldon attempted to get out of bounds but couldn't. Overtime in the Iron Bowl. Hold on a minute. There was a second left before he stepped out. Just listen to Nick Saban, he's screaming that fact. The refs agree. Bama could win it right now, they have their chance. It would be a 57-yard field goal if they wanted it, or a 40-yard Hail Mary. Despite all the struggles kicking, not only did Saban go for three, he put his freshman backup kicker to go for broke. The kid had a stronger leg, not quite as accurate, but what's the worst that could happen? Auburn iced the kick, and then it went up. Looks good. Looks good. Oh, just short. Wait. Davis is going to run it all the way back. Auburn's going to win the football game. The kick six, or if you really know your stuff, kick Bama kick, sent Auburn into the SEC championship game, which they won, and the national championship game, which they lost. But Alabama couldn't win it. They couldn't three-peat. Knowing they did that is more than enough to satisfy an Auburn fan. It's arguably the best college football game ever. There's a saying in Alabama that there's two types of people. Those who listen to Paul Feinbaum and liars. Maybe they lie because it's a silly thing to obsess about every day. Maybe it's because they call in themselves and wish to stay anonymous. I think the worst Auburn fan I could dig up was Bobby from Homewood. He called in to reveal that a popular Alabama caller was recently diagnosed with cancer and called the diagnosis cosmic karma for his Auburn hate. That's bad. Bobby is one of the only callers to be permanently banned from the show, but the worst Alabama caller is a lot more bad. Al from Dadeville. He called in after Auburn's 2010 title, the offseason after the comeback went down. Al, a diehard bammer whose real name was Harvey Updike, got revenge in his own way for the heartbreaking loss. See, Auburn students have a tradition of throwing toilet paper on a couple big oak trees at a place called Toomer's Corner after big game wins. So Harvey, as one does when upset, poisoned the 80-year-old oak trees. And then he called the Feinbaum show to brag about and admit to the crime. Okay, well, let me tell you what I did. The weekend after the Iron Bowl, I went to Auburn, Alabama, because I lived 30 miles away, sure. and I poisoned the two tumors trees. 
Okay, well, that's fair. I put spike 80 DLP in them. Is that against the, the, the law to poison a tree? Well, do you think I care? Mm, no. Okay, I really don't. Okay. Roll down tide. It doesn't get worse than this. Anywhere. Harvey's excuse, so to say, was that Auburn had celebrated by TPing the trees the day Bear Bryant died all those years ago. That claim has no proof, and people love arguing about whether it's true, so I honestly don't know. It's low, but it wouldn't be too shocking. That doesn't excuse what he did, though. Another of his reasons was Auburn fans throwing a Cam Newton jersey on the Bear Bryant statue in 2010, which he took as disrespectful. Neither of these excuse Harvey's actions, period. But it happened. Auburn lost a legit piece of its history. The trees had to be removed as they were past the point of saving, and new ones were put in. Updike was sentenced to three years in prison and got out after six months with fines he could never pay off and eventually passed away deep in debt. I do, however, feel it is my duty to inform you what Harvey Updike named his children. His son's name is Bear. Bear Bryant Updeck. I did not make that up. His daughter's name is Crimson. Crimson Tide Updike. Is this the proper time to say it just means more? The next season saw the highest scoring Iron Bowl ever. A few years later, we learned that even if Alabama loses the Iron Bowl and doesn't play in the SEC Championship, they can still make the playoff and win a national title. The first overtime didn't really know how to end and went quadruple. And all the way up until the most recent year, fourth and goal from the 31-yard line. Who cares how impossible that sounds? Hope is never dead. This game continues to produce some of the greatest finishes in sports. Alabama has won four in a row. They'll be heavily favored to win it again this year. That doesn't really matter. Two teams full of 20-year-olds who have been genetically engineered to be enemies will take the field for four quarters. It's pounded in their heads that the other side is not your equal. They think they are better than you. Now go prove them wrong. In 2011, the governor of Alabama released an official statement about the Iron Bowl. Conversation often permeates, especially around the time of a catastrophe like the tree poisoning or one of many murders, about stopping the game. Maybe our ancestors had it right. Should we even play? Is it really worth all this? The governor floated around this idea. But in the words of who else but a random guy from Alabama, I'll leave you with this. The governor's call for decency runs so contrary to the spirit of the rivalry that people think he is an idiot for expecting fans to be civil. You can ask people to calm down, but expecting it of these people? Well, that is just plain idiotic. <laughs> Thank you.